Hello, Dr. Scott here, and welcome to a very special episode of Game Closet. Now, retro video games, they go hand in hand with nostalgia, that feeling of home or the carefree days before our adult lives began. Sometimes a favorite game can take you back to a place in time that was very special just because there was magic in that moment. For some, a favorite game may have lived in an air-conditioned, neon-lit arcade where kids spent their weekly allowances a coin at a time until they pulled lint out of their pockets. For others, it was a cassette being slowly loaded into the RAM buffer of a warmly remembered now-defunct computer. I have asked a couple of friends from around YouTube and Facebook this question. What is your favorite memory of a video game and gaming console or arcade game from days long past? Do you still have that game, console, or computer they used to play it on? And these fantastic friends have taken the time to share their stories with us. Let's begin with the undisputed king and queen of retro nostalgia. We go all the way to Los Angeles to the Retro Recipes kitchen to visit Perry Fractic and Lady Fractic of Perry Fractic's Retro Recipes. Take it away, guys. That's a really good question. My favorite memory, and probably my oldest memory, is sitting in my bedroom, sitting next to my best friend Danny at the time, who I've mentioned many times on the show, playing the original Super Nintendo Brothers on the original NES, and both of us jumping when Mario would jump. And we would be so wrapped up in trying not to fall down the hole, especially during some like the speed rounds, during some of the levels you have to go super fast so that you don't fall. Yeah. And we'll just do that. Every yeah, time. we would just together we would both be jumping. I Made mean, her do it. Yeah. Hello. That's funny. So that was the Nintendo the original NES? The Nintendo Entertainment System, like that one to your that left. Lego. But not a Lego one, presumably. No, it was a real one. Yeah, mine was a real Commodore 64. I just happened to be holding the games, oh, coincidentally. Wow. <laughs> My favorite memory is Ghostbusters. Is... Ghostbusters! <laughs> it's getting that for Christmas. Oh. And, yes, and it not working uh, because, well, Activision had released a faulty batch. So I just have this ingrained memory of uh, pressing play on that Commodore data set probably a, a 20 or 30 times loading the whole game and it would just get to the final flashing loader and then just go blank. Devastating, but also weirdly nostalgic and, and ingrained <laughs> through repetition. So we went back to WH Smith's Boxing Day or the 27th and got a working copy. And uh, yeah, I was, I was still playing it today. In fact, I played this about a week ago on that computer <laughs> over there, my childhood bedroom computer recreation. So yeah, when are you recreating your bedroom? Um, <laughs> he says never. Never. <laughs> but a very good question though, and hope that helps. Thank you, Lord and Lady Fractic, for sharing your stories. And now let's head all the way down to Texas to visit Retro Rob and his fortress of gamitude, the Game House. Oh, Rob, are you home? Hey, what's up everyone, it's Retro Rob here, and I uh, just thought I would share with you one of the games in my life that means a lot to me, I uh, have a sentimental value for, uh, and that's uh, Batman for the Nintendo Game Boy handheld. This came out about 1989, roughly around when the big Batman craze was hitting. Um, Batman, of course, was everywhere. It was Batman cereal, Batman t-shirts, uh, just Batman, Batman uh, mania, Batman mania was sweeping the nation. And uh, I was uh, in the eighth grade, uh, I was living actually in Rhode Island, and uh, we actually couldn't get the Game Boy, I remember when it first came out. Um, I had to wait a little bit, because money was just, it was a pretty expensive system at the time, and uh, I had no other gaming systems in my house. I had only grown up with Tiger LCD handhelds. Uh, but this one, this one's special because uh, this is, this is the first game we were able to buy um, besides the pack-in Tetris. And not only that, but this is the first game I've ever beat in my, what you call, I guess, gaming uh, uh, career. <laughs> and so um, it means it means a lot to me that um, not only that I finally got a game outside of Tetris, but uh, I, you know, a game that you, you beat, you know, you, you learn these patterns, you study them, you, you play for hours on end. And uh, I'll never forget when I beat this, I was actually 
in the living room uh, with my siblings. My parents were out for the night. Uh, big bro, big, big sis were in charge, and uh, I was just in the Game Boy. Uh, you know, just uh, fighting a good fight, and uh, sure enough, I finally got to the very end uh, and and beat it. And I was just jumping around, just like an idiot in the living room. And, uh, they were all laughing at me, but uh, it felt really good. It felt really good to uh, to, to have that, and uh, then you want more, right? So, uh, luckily, my library started to slowly grow um, as we, you know, as a, as, a, as a years passed, and um, still picked up a few more Tiger LCD games as well with it. But uh, uh, I always, I always hold Batman as like my favorite. My favorite. People ask me like, "What's your favorite game?" And I always refer to this because. <laughs> Um, we were able to afford an actual gaming system, uh, and I was able to have something that, you know, other kids had Nintendos and Sega Master Systems, and I just wasn't, this just wasn't in the cards for us at the time, so for my parents to get me that game, and then to the original Game Boy that I still have, um, I will always hold it dear to my heart, and it, it literally, this literally started my gaming, um, just love, uh, this, this is a starting point, it was a Nintendo Game Boy, and I've been gaming ever since, and, um, it's just been great. I uh, just wanted to share again, like I said, what, what game that was really sentimental to me and uh, the system that it's for, which I still have. And uh, Doc, thanks for having me on here for this. This is really awesome. And hey, thanks everyone. Thanks for watching. <laughs> well, thanks for dropping in, Retro Robin. Thanks for sharing about your favorite game. We go from Texas all the way to Beantown, Boston, Massachusetts, to visit with our friend, the cool and stylish Technish of Caps Off Gaming. Oh, Technish, the floor is yours. Hey, y'all, this is me, Technish from Caps Off Gaming, and I'm here on the Game Closet to talk about one of my most nostalgic games, retro games from back in the day. And I have to pull out this... <laughs> This is my original copy of Shinobi on the Master System. My Archie Betty, yo, God bless her. <laughs> she bought this for me for Christmas. Not just this game, but she bought me the system. It was during the time of, you know, the big beef between Nintendo and Sega and everything like that. And what I ended up saying was like, yeah, I'm, tr I'm trying to be outside the box. Like, I like Sega. I think the biggest thing with Sega was just the music. The music was so different compared to 8-bit NES and everything like that. And uh, one of the first games I did have was Hang On. And I also had Safari Hunt because I had the light gun um, pack and everything. But this was gifted to me like right after on my birthday. And uh, I played this game in the arcade a bunch of times. And I Lo and behold, like surprising to me is that the music was, the, well, it wasn't the same, but it was very similar. Along with the gameplay, which wasn't as great as it was game, but it's still, the music carried it on. So in terms of nostalgia, like this is one of my original joints. I look back here in 1988, <laughs> this game came out. Uh, yeah, very fond memory. Um, when it comes to like gaming, retro gaming, and nostalgia. Again, I'm gonna shout out Game Closet, and then also, yo, my man Doc, for well, you know, including me in this joint, yo. I appreciate it, yo. Peace out. Kind of terrible this game. Oh. Wow. Well, thank you, Technish, for stopping by the Game Closet and for your story about the Master Shinobi. Now from the home of Cheers and the Big Green Monster, we now go all the way north of my home state of Ohio to the fair yet square host of the YouTube channel, Square Pegs, Jay Malone. Take it away, Jay. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I'm Jay from the YouTube channel, Square Pegs, and I was asked if I could talk about a game that means a lot to me from my past. While I'm sure a lot of folks are going to jump back to like the NES and the Atari 2600, and that's super cool. I'm actually going to go a little bit more recent. We're going back to the Nintendo DS, and we're talking about a game called Henry Hatsworth and the Puzzling Adventure. Now, why is this obscure DS title so important to me? And I'll tell you, it's because I worked on it. If you don't know me, I used to work in the video game industry. I worked at Electronic Arts Tiburon in Orlando, Florida for about seven years, and I worked on some unbelievably incredible titles. I worked on NCAA football. I worked on NASCAR, Tiger Woods, Fight Night. Uh, I got to do some time on Mirror's Edge in a support role. 
And it was an amazing time in my life. One of the things that I really wanted to achieve before I left was to work on something that wasn't a sports game. Now, I, I said Mirror's Edge, but that was in a support role. It wasn't something where I was heading up a test team or anything like that. So when I was assigned the responsibility of overseeing the work on Henry Hatsworth and the Puzzling Adventure, I was ecstatic. I loved the DS. I thought it was an incredibly ambitious console, and the game that they had laid out for what Hatsworth was was an ambitious design with a fantastic look, great sound, and unbelievable gameplay that I thought had the opportunity to be something really special. Now, I personally believe that Henry Hatsworth is the most underrated DS game that you've never heard of because, I mean, I think we sold something like 50,000 copies, and it's a shame because I think more people would have loved it. If you don't know what it is, it is an action platformer where you control the named Henry Hatsworth, and that's on the top screen. And on the bottom screen is a match three puzzle game that are running that's running at the same time. You have to swap in between both screens as you're playing because constantly the bottom screen will have things going up and going up. And if they get to the top of the screen, they will shoot enemies into the top screen, making things more difficult for you. I thought it was a brilliant title. And I really, really appreciated my time on it because I thought it was just an incredible game. And one of the questions was, do you still have this game you worked on? And the answer is, yeah, I've got it right here. Now, if you look, what's special about this copy is that it's autographed by everyone on my test team. Everyone that worked on it signed their name on here, and this is something that I will never get rid of. It's an absolute treasure. It's something that I truly love and something that I think is one of the best games on the DS, and I'm so fortunate to have worked on it. Thank you so much for letting me talk about my time in the industry for talking about a game that's near and dear to my heart. And now, back to the game closet. Thank you, Jay, for stopping by to tell us your story about your favorite Henry Hatsworth. Now, I've never heard of that game before, so I just ordered a copy, and it should be here in a couple of days. Your package is here. Hey, a goodie! It's already here! <laughs> Yay! Awesome! Jay, would you please sign my copy the next time I see you? We now head back to Ohio to hear from someone that makes me laugh on his YouTube channel, Johnny Graphics. John, hit us with your best shot. As far as nostalgic games go for me, that's pretty hard to choose. There's a lot to pick from, but if you're going to make me, I guess I have to choose this one. Legendary X2 was, I'm pretty sure, the first actual console game that I actually played at home with my family, not at an arcade. Which, keep in mind, this was the early 90s and arcades were the main way to play video games. I mean, consoles were definitely a thing. It wasn't at all like it is now. It was not nearly as ubiquitous as it is now. And my mom and dad were not exactly eager to go out and spend 200 bucks on this, you know, game console that they didn't really know all that much about and didn't really care about. But for whatever reason, one day my dad actually did for, again, I have no idea why, but he was willing to drop the 70 or 80 bucks or whatever he found a Turbo Graphics on sale for, got a few games, brought it home, and we had a ball. For like a week, we just constantly played these handful of games. I think we had Bonk, Legendary X1, 2, and probably Soldier Blade or a couple of shooters. And uh, the one that's really just stuck out with me the whole time was this one. I could not put it down to this day. I still play it. You know, I don't go more than a month or so without playing this for at least a few minutes. I just really like it. The music is outstanding. The art direction, the style of it, it's all very unique. There's really nothing else quite like it. It's not even really all that much like the first Legendary Axe, which some people kind of complain about. I don't know. I think it's fine that it's totally different, but perhaps it should have been called Legendary Sword, maybe, because the axe is really kind of an afterthought in this game. The sword is really the weapon you want, probably 90% of the time, and when you don't, you're probably going to want the sickle because of the extra range it gives you. I rarely, if ever, see a need for the axe. I mean, it's, a, it's the most powerful of the three, but the range is so short that there's just not a lot of reason to use it over the sword, in my opinion. But in any case, it's a great game, and it actually combines a lot of platforming with the combat. You can actually jump on enemies' heads and integrate that into the combat, which there's very few games that really did that, you know, that were hack and slash games. If you were a platformer, like Sonic or something, and then, yeah, that was a big deal, but you didn't really see that in games like this. Some levels are more vertical than others. Some have more of a straight combat focus, and it all felt good, although there was one part of, I think, level four, Five, I want to say, where when you're platforming, even if you're doing it perfectly right, you could still get sent all the way back down to the bottom after making a bunch of progress. And that 
kind of made me want to die. But other than that, the game is super tight. There's really almost nothing to complain about. To this day, still one of my favorite games of all time. It's a 10 out of 10 game. If you haven't played it, you're doing life wrong and you should definitely play it. Like right now. Find a way, get it, play it. Thank you, Johnny Graphics, for a humorous and nostalgic look at a great-looking TurboGrafx-16 game that I need to play. From the heartland of the USA all the way back to the West Coast to the beautiful state of Washington, we visit a surgeon of sorts. He'll perform open cart surgery right before your very eyes. And as a connoisseur of breakfast cereals, you know him and love him. It's Mr. John Riggs. Oh, John, what do you have for us? One of my favorite video game memories that comes to mind immediately, um, and believe it, I, I, I got some years <laughs> on a few of the people in this video. Um, I remember when Donkey Kong came out. I remember when Donkey Kong Jr. was a new game. Uh, but one of my favorite gaming memories, believe it or not, came uh, around my college years when my friends and I would play Fire Pro Wrestling S Six Man Scramble through all hours of the night. Uh, this game for the Sega Saturn... Fire Pro Wrestling, six players simultaneous. We would stay up all night creating these wrestlers, uh, both wrestlers that we would see on TV, like WWE, ECW, and all that. Uh, we would also just like, you know, create random characters or like make, make wrestlers from anime that we were watching. Um, and we spent more time creating the wrestlers and actually playing the game. Because the playing the game, that's the fun part too. Six player Royal Rumble style, uh, you know, just have a lot of fun with things like that too. But just the hilarity and just staying up all night and ordering pizza and uh, drinking Mountain Dew and playing, I mean, you know, just, you know, the stereotypical gamer food, right? <laughs> and just staying up and um, playing Fire Pro Wrestling as Six Man Scramble. Um, still one of my favorite Fire Pro games today, both for nostalgia and I just love the game too. I love that era. Of, uh, I love that era of wrestling when that game came out specifically. And I still have it. It's, a, it's in a box in the other room. Case is a little cracked, but, um, you know, that that's one game that I'll hold on to um, both physically just because I love it and hold on to it personally because of the uh, great feelings and, uh, the, you know, those feel-good vibes. <laughs> thinking about uh, staying up all night. And especially especially when they had this, like six people over, and some of those people don't even care for wrestling, but they liked this game because it was so easy just to pick up and play. And as soon as you learn the timing of it, um, man, we all had a great time, man. That's what it's all about. Thank you so much, John Riggs, for stopping by the Game Closet and telling us about your college days nostalgic story about Fire Pro Wrestling Six Men Scramble. Well, Game Closeteers, there are so many different games and instances I could regale you with, but I'd like to tell you about one that's very near and dear to my heart. We go back to the year 2001 to the era of Dreamcast, and one of the most fun games you'd ever play. But the reason this memory is so special is because of this beautiful child. That's my eldest son when he was about two playing Sega Marine Fishing. Cameron loved playing that game by himself, with help of course, or with his pap pap, my dad who is no longer with us. And that's me before I got my fake PhD and little Cameron letting me help him catch a whopper of a fish. Well, that little boy isn't little anymore, and I wish that little one could play that game with me just one more time. And this is that copy of Sega Marine Fishing, the fishing controller, and of course a moment ago you saw the Dreamcast. That special moment is tucked gently away in my memory and gets dusted off occasionally, and I'm happy that I could share it with you today. I would like to sincerely thank my friends for lending me a hand with this video and for sharing their wonderful stories. Please check out their links in the description below and give them all a follow and a subscribe. I would like to thank you for stopping by Game Closet. Normally the antics around here are more on the humorous side, but this week I thought we would give you just a little more heart. Please share the video, like, and subscribe. Hey, uh, how was that, kiddo? You did okay. Can we play the fish again now? Sure. For you, sweetie, anything. We'll see you soon. Thank you for subscribing to Game Closet. It's absolutely free, and you can help us get to our next goal of 1,000 subscribers. Hit the like mitten so YouTube will share our videos to more and more cool people just like you. We will see you very, very soon.